Hey, how's it going? So today I'm going to talk about the star args and double star quarks or keyword arguments. And um, this is, again, a, a feature in Python that can be a little bit arcane if you're seeing it for the first time, just because it looks a little bit weird and it has this strange sounding name, right? Arg and quark and what is this even good for? So I want to talk about how these things work, what they're good for, and how you can use them to write better programs, to write more Pythonic Python, and um, just become a better Python developer. All right, so how do these guys work? How do these arcs and quarks work? So let's take a look at the simple example here. So I'm defining this function foo here that um, takes one required parameter, and then it um, also has these arcs and quarks here. And what it's then going to do, it's uh, it's going to print all of these uh, these these uh, arguments, right? So if we have arcs, we're going to print them. If we have quarks, we have them. Uh, we're going to print them. And um, we're also going to print the required argument. And that is going to be our test bed to actually inspect what's going on behind the scenes. So first of all, what you can see here is that this function, because of this definition, it will require at least one argument that's called required. But it can also accept um, extra positional and keyword arguments. Now, if we call this function with extra arguments, then args will collect all of the non-named or positional arguments and quarks will collect all of the um, keyword arguments. And um, this happens because these parameters are called args or quarks, but because of that little star operator, right? It's just sort of a naming convention to call them args and quarks. And they're kind of piratey and easy to remember, right? Arg and quark. Okay, so we have this foo function now. And what I want to do now is call it with various combinations of arguments so that you can see what actually happens behind the scenes. So the first case is really easy. We're just going to call foo without any arguments. And then Python is going to complain that, hey, I need at least this one argument called required. So um, I guess that was kind of expected. Now, the second case is where we would call foo with the required argument, just going to put in hello. And you can see here, okay, we get hello as the printout. It looks like we didn't have any arcs or quarks. And now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to call foo again. I'm still giving it this uh, string here as the required argument. And then I'm adding a bunch more uh, numbers here that are going to be the extra positional arguments. So when I call this, you can see here that it printed the the arcs here, right? So now we had arcs, it, arcs wasn't empty, but um, now it's actually a tuple containing all of the extra positional arguments that were collected. And now we can go beyond that. And besides having these extra positional arguments, I've also added these two extra keyword arguments, right? Called them uh, key one and key two. Now, when I run this, you can see here that this result is pretty much the same as before. But now we also have this dictionary here that contains all of the extra keyword arguments. So we didn't, or the function didn't really ask for any of these arguments to be passed in, but it was able to handle them. And the Python runtime collected all of the extra arguments inside this um, args tuple and this quarks or keyword args dictionary, which means that now our function can use them for something useful. So you, with that method, you could create functions that react differently depending on how many or you know what kinds of parameters you pass in, um, which could be useful. They also allow you some other techniques that I want to show you now. Okay, so the first technique that we can use these um, extra positional and extra keyword arguments for is that we can write wrapper functions that um, modify or you know do something to those arguments and then actually pass them on to the original function. So here I've, I've redefined foo um, again, and now foo is actually calling bar, but before it calls bar with the same arguments, it makes some modifications to arcs and keyword um, arcs. So you can see that here where, where with uh, keyword arcs is really easy because this is just a dictionary. So you can, uh, you know, mutate it in place. And I just added this uh, name key to keyword arcs. With arcs, 
because it's a tuple, you need to create a new object and then use that because tuples are immutable, so you can't add stuff to them. Um, so here, you know what I'm doing, I'm just taking args and I'm adding this extra string here. I store that as new args and then when I call the uh, the original function or the wrapped function I pass all of this stuff to bar the original x and then the new args and the modified keyword args using this um, star and double star operator and this gives us a way to wrap an existing function um, and actually make some modifications to the arguments that are getting passed in and then still kind of reassembling everything and calling the original function. And kind of the nice thing about that is that um, I don't really have to know what args or keyword args looks like, right? So I can just kind of take whatever I'm given and then, um, or I can write a function that takes whatever it's given and then it can make modifications where it wants to and then pass that on. Now, this sounds a little bit dangerous, and it totally is because it can definitely create a maintenance nightmare. But in some cases, when you're wrapping um, some external library, this could be the way to go, right? So I just wanted to point that out. But in general, you maybe want to be careful with that. All right, here's another example. So um, this method can also be really helpful for subclassing. So let's say you want to extend the behavior of a parent class without having to replicate the full signature of its constructor in the child class. And for example, if you're working with an API that changes outside of your control. Um, so, you know, this is the ever popular car class that takes a um, color in the mileage. And then I've um, extended that with the always blue car class that um, is going to call the parent class. So it's going to call the parent class constructor with this super dunder init. And then it's just going to override the color. And now you can see here the way this is implemented, I didn't actually duplicate um, the information up here, the parameters up here. So I didn't call this color and mileage and so on. But I just said, hey, give me everything that was there previously. And then I took those and forwarded it to the original constructor up here. And then I just went in and kind of overrode the color to be blue. Now, while this is a super powerful technique for wrapping these, um, these classes or changing the behavior of a class that you don't want to kind of replicate large portions of it, and maybe you just want to selectively override something um, if, it's, if it's not a class that you have control over because it's a third party class, then this could be a viable method just to kind of patch that information in. But on the other hand, there's some downsides associated with it as well. So one downside is that now this always blue car has a really unhelpful um, signature in its constructor, right? It just says args and quarks, which doesn't really tell you the kind of arguments it expects. So you would have to fix that with a good dark string and say, hey, you really want to look up the car class. This is just a thin wrapper around it. Um, be careful with that. Now, the most likely scenario where you would use a technique like that, if you want to override some external class or some behavior in an external class, which you don't control, which is a pretty good motivation, but you know, it's always dangerous territory to do that, right? Or otherwise, probably it's going to be you who's going to be screaming arc and quark if you're doing that too much. So I would definitely be careful with this because it's a super uh, potentially helpful technique, but on the other hand, it could also be extremely um, dangerous. Okay, and there's actually a third way where you can use this uh, technique for great effect, and that's when you're writing decorators, which um, are basically wrappers around other functions. And there, it's um, pretty much all of the code examples you see out there, um, they're going to use this technique to wrap a function and just forward arguments to it. Right, so this is where you can apply that method as well. So this is a really powerful feature in Python, and this is definitely something that I would play with and explore if you want to become a better developer and make your Python code more clean and beautiful and more Pythonic, because um, it is used quite frequently. So um, play with it and understand how it really works. That would be my recommendation. But of course, with a technique like that, it's kind of this with a lot of power, or with, with great power comes great responsibility, right? So you want to make sure you balance that to keep your code explicit enough to kind of balance it with the need just to, well, you know, for your convenience versus the convenience of the future developer or the, your future self is going to be working with that code. So, you know, again, I just wanted to mention that because it's a tough choice to make. And it's definitely something 
that a great developer should be thinking about when they're writing code. So I hope this helped you out. I go deeper into the subject in uh, my book called Python Tricks. So if you liked this episode of Python Tricks, the sort of the videos and on the YouTube channel, then be sure to check out the book. I'm sure you'll love the book. It's a great way to recap all of that stuff and then go deeper into other subjects. And um, it's a great way to solidify your learning and to actually have a handy reference for all of this stuff that you can apply in your day-to-day -day work. All right, happy Pythoning, and I talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.